Welcome everyone. We are so excited for today's session of uh, Women in Global Health Exploring Non-Academic Careers. This series was designed to expose doctoral students and junior professionals to an array of non-academic global health careers using a women's leadership lens. The series is supported in part by the Johns Hopkins Provost PhD Professional Development Initiative, and it's also supported by a multidisciplinary steering committee of faculty at Hopkins, including Drs. Yuka Manabe, Becky Genberg, Michelle Decker, and Nancy Glass. Today, we are excited to have with us former Secretary of State and alumna of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Dr. Madeline Albright. She served as the first female U.S. Secretary of State and the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and this year published a book, Hell and Other Destinations, a 21st Century Memoir. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Dr. Albright. We're really excited to have you. Great to be with you. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. So I'd like to share briefly an agenda for today's session and then a few housekeeping rules and then we'll jump right into the questions. So I'm going to begin today by having a conversation with uh, Dr. Albright and then we'll open it up to a Q&A with the audience. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and have conversations about what we're discussing today. If you have any questions for that Q&A session at the end, we would ask that you put them in the Q&A box and not in the chat. If you put them in the chat, it's likely that we'll have too many conversations going and we won't be able to keep track of them. So please add any questions to the Q&A function. And I don't think you have much control over it, but please don't try to unmute yourself. Um, we are anticipating a number of participants today and really wanna make sure we have the bandwidth for, for our conversations. Today's topics will include education. We'll talk about mentorship, the importance of organizational cultures, soft skills, and current events. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can just jump right into the first question. So give me a moment, please. Okay, so I think there are no slides anymore. I hope that that's right for everyone. And we'll start with asking some questions about education and career. In a Talks with Google episode, you spoke about your book, Fascism, A Warning, in which you stated, the older I get, the younger the teachers are. What skills or tools do you suggest to young professionals who are going back to school for their doctoral degrees, particularly if they plan on pursuing non-academic careers? Well, first of all, I'm really delighted to be a part of this discussion and hope that I can add something to it. Um, I do think that what is important for young professionals is to know that uh, things don't happen overnight, uh, that uh, one really has to go through a series of steps uh, in any career pattern, frankly. And I think that one of the things that um, is irritating to people is if somebody brand new comes in and starts saying that they want to do things every uh, totally differently. And I do think that it is important to manage two things at the same time, how to be a part of whatever culture you're stepping into, but also not forgetting what your goals are and how you can fit into it. And, and uh, I don't mean being a coward or kind of uh, holding back, but I do think it's very important to kind of get a lay of the land as you go into something and think about why you are there and what are the other people expecting of you and how do you maintain your individuality but be part of a team. So in many ways, it's a lot of kind of uh, uh, competitive ideas that uh, may get in the way of each other, but uh, it comes from my own experience. When you were a doctoral student at Columbia University, what was your mindset and what would you suggest for current doctoral students in this climate? I think I have to explain a little bit where I was in my life at the time and what had really happened to me. Um, I had um, initially decided that I was not going to go to graduate school, um, and I had gone to a women's college, by the way, at some time between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire, um, and uh, we had as our uh, commencement speaker the then current Secretary of Defense, because his daughter was in our class, and we kind of remember things all a little bit differently, but he basically said that our main responsibility was to get married and raise interesting children. Um, and so uh, 
I waited a long time to get married, three days after graduation. Um, I had wanted to be a journalist uh, and uh, was told by my uh, husband's managing uh, editor that, um, uh, honey, uh, go find something else to do because you can't work on the same paper as your husband um, and you wouldn't want to compete with him uh, with the other uh, uh, three other papers in Chicago at the time. So what happened was that uh, we moved to out of Chicago to Long Island and I was pregnant. And uh, it turned out I had twins um, that I had to leave in incubators for a long time. And so I decided at that point that I would go back to school. And I started taking Russian um, at Hofstra uh, and uh, loved it. And so that then drove me to decide that I would go to graduate school. We moved to Washington and that's when I went to SICE. But what happened to me, then I was at SICE for a couple of years and then moved back to New York and went to Columbia. So at the time that I was going to Columbia, I had twins that were um, three or four years old at that time. Um, I lived on Long Island, so I had to commute in. Uh, and so I had a very, um, I think, peculiar view. I loved what I was studying um, and took everything for Columbia. You have a choice of taking some things for credit and some not. And by the way, I turned the course that I took at SICE which we nicknamed Wide Wide World, um, into um, a lot of credits at Columbia. But my main thing was trying to do well, uh, which I always prided myself on, and then trying to combine this crazy life of having little children and having a long commute. And so um, it was, uh, I think I had very mixed feelings. I loved it, but I wasn't able to participate as much in some of the other aspects of getting a graduate education because I had all these other things to do. And I do think that this is true for a lot of women is that uh, we are always multitasking, which I've decided is actually a strength, not a weakness. But um, it did give me um, a very special look at what it was like to be getting a degree. And it took me forever, frankly. Um, and so I always had the question as to whether I was going to be kicked out of the program or whether I could get an extension. I could get an extension by getting pregnant. I did once, but after a while that became counterproductive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. So you've talked a little bit about balance, which I, I mean, I just think it's an impossible word these days and I'll, I'll come up with a question uh, later for that. But I, I want to think again about your graduate credentials. I mean, how have these academic credentials now, your doctoral degrees, how have they played a role in obtaining leadership positions, or have they? They definitely have. And again, it'll take me a minute to tell you about this. In the middle of my um, graduate school um, experience, um, uh, we moved back to Washington. And I was working on my dissertation forever. Um, but I also wanted to do other things. And I began to get involved in politics and school boards and a variety of kind of volunteer activities. Um, and uh, I, I met a lot of different people and I had a reputation for uh, finishing something that I'd begun. I mean, I had a, um, in terms of being responsible and dependable. So what happened was um, I was working on a political campaign uh, with Ed Muskie, who was the Senator from Maine um, at the time. And his, um, and I got to know him very well. We got to be very good friends and I had done some fundraising for him. And his um, chief, uh, um, his uh, legislative assistant, his chief legislative assistant left. Um, and so he needed somebody immediately. And it was interesting because he could say, this is Dr. Albright and not just my friend, Madeline Albright. And it made a difference because I moved in laterally into a very high level job. Then the other thing that happened, and my, my life field, as we talk about, it, is full of accidental good things that happened. Um, I then, my, uh, one of my professors from Columbia, Dr. Brzezinski, became national security advisor. Um, and he called me up and asked me if I wanted to come and work in the White House in the National Security Council staff. Um, and so that was because I had known him and he knew that I had a doctorate. Um, and I, and then I was a combination of understanding um, political science from a doctoral 
uh, academic point of view, but also had experience in the political field. So it was that combination, but it certainly made a difference to all of a sudden be Dr. Albright rather than just Madeline. So I appreciate that you talk about these accidental good things because in the, in the conversations we've had as part of this series, that's been a theme uh, that things sort of em emerge and you have to take advantage of them. So what advice might you have for younger women about taking advantage of these accidental good things or opportunities that emerge that you might not expect? Well, I think it's important to, uh, you never know how things come up. And, and I certainly would never have predicted, I, I could spend hours going through the details of how I got from one thing to another. But I do think that uh, one of the aspects, I think, is first of all, kind of knowing the people that you are around, what their interests are. Um, and most likely, uh, you will, somebody will have met you somewhere and will think that you could do X. Um, and I think it's always worth exploring. I think the issue is whether, um, I, I am very good at rationalizing, uh, and I can uh, really explain that the way I've moved from one thing to another has really expanded my horizons and made me more valuable. But I think you have to have kind of a, an approach which is, well, let's try it, you know. And I'm, I like people, I am curious, I like to keep learning. But the thing that has recommended me to people um, is in terms of my reputation, which is if I take something on, I will finish it, I'm dependable. And also, and I think this is very hard, especially if you have a doctorate or, or a doctor, uh, is how to be willing to do things that you might think are beneath you. Um, mm. I made a lot of coffee, um, you know, or Xeroxed or whatever, and, and, I'm, and I was useful, which then, depending upon what opportunities came out, somebody might say, well, I've worked with Madeline and she always finishes and she has some good ideas and let's give her a chance. So you've talked about a number of skills now, being dependable, rationalizing. You talked earlier about multitasking. I want to transition to talk about soft skills a bit. So during your TED Talk in 2010, you said that women are better at having more empathy and putting ourselves into other people's shoes. And these are often described as soft skills, which can have a gendered connotation. Do you think soft skills are teachable? And if so, should academic programs be bolstering these types of skills for both men and women? Um, I think, you know, the term sounds pejorative. Um, and what I always loved, Hillary Clinton, we, there was always this discussion in political science about hard power and soft power. Um, and so she decided instead of calling it soft power, calling it smart power. Hmm. And, and I think we might want to do that about these skills. Um, basically. Uh, I do think that women have different skills. There's no question. Um, and by the way, uh, in uh, the medical field, I've had an interesting time. I've, the, the countries that have in fact been able to deal with the virus are primarily ones that are run by women. Um, in Taiwan, in New Zealand, in Germany, um, Norway, Denmark, Iceland. And I've been asked why? How does that happen? And I think it does have something to do with the skills, uh, the smart skills, i.e. that we are good at multitasking, which we have to be given our lives, which gives us peripheral vision so that we can kind of mm. see things out there. This is a gross generalization. I think that uh, women have peripheral vision and multitasking. Men are more likely to think deeply about one subject, um, which is why actually we can be good partners. But I also do think that women are natural caregivers uh, and that also that women do not want to uh, have one group of their children arguing with the other group of the children. So you try to unify things. And, and I think we work hard. And I think that those skills are the kind uh, that uh, are very useful, soft or smart. Um, I also do think that women are problem solvers. Um, there's no question about that. And so um, I think we have to be proud of what we can do uh, and not feel kind of put down in any shape or form. Um, and I do think, and this is something 
and uh, we can talk more about this because I've spent so much time thinking about this, is uh, how, if you're the only woman in the room, who do you behave? Um, and what skills do you use? Um, and so uh, there's a lot to this subject. Um, well, so I, I think, yes, let's talk more about that. How do, how do you do that if you're the only woman in the room? Because it's still, that's still the scenario for many people. Yeah, yeah. So let me go back on something, and this is the luck part. Um, I have to admit this, that because I had my credentials together, just at the time um, in the 70s and 80s when people were looking for a woman to have on staff, um, I did have my credentials together. So I had an advantage in some ways, but I ended up often being the only woman in the room. Um, and one of the things that uh, I, I really do think is important to think about, I loved Ed Muskie. He was my mentor, he was terrific. And even he was somebody that didn't quite get it, even though he had hired me to do this very important job. So I get called by Brzezinski to come and do congressional relations and and Muskie, and I went to Muskie to try to figure out what he thought. And this man that I adored said, I don't think a woman can do congressional relations. And so that kind of was off putting. I went and I did it. But then just to tell you another story, he then obviously felt badly about it and he gave a big party for me and he had tons of staff. And so I get there and he looks out at the staff and he said, I now see that I have a lot of women on my staff uh, but Madeline was special because she was the first one to give sex to the office. And I said, no, gender, gender. Mm. <laughs> Vocabulary <laughs> sometimes gets in the way. But anyway, uh, being the only woman in the room, and I'm sure that many people have had this experience, you think to yourself, you're going to say something. Um, and then you think, no, it'll sound stupid. So you don't say it. And then some man says it and everybody thinks it's brilliant and you're really mad at yourself. And so uh, when I, I kind of figured that out and then I went to go and teach at Georgetown in the 80s and I had co-ed classes. And so I had made up my mind that my motto was that women had to interrupt. If you mm -hmm. raise your hand, you often don't get called on until your point is no longer germane. And, and then I made up a turn, which was active listening. If you listen in a way so that you will interrupt. Um, you think about what you're going to say. You have to be prepared and you have to have a strong voice. Mm -hmm. So then when I started teaching, I said nobody should raise their hands. Um, and so uh, everybody had to interrupt. My classes were a bit of a zoo, but um, I do think that there has to be a way to be, uh, to, to understand the environment. But the best thing is to have more than one woman in the room. Um, you know, so that there's a way, um, in fact, to, to really be able to say uh, something like, you know, um, I agree with Anne or whatever, so that there really is some way to uh, support each other because that's what men do. And so I think that there has to be more than one woman and the woman has to be willing to interrupt. But I have to tell you, even with what I just said, I end up at the UN and uh, I am the only woman on the Security Council representing the United States and 14 men are sitting there glaring at me. And uh, most of the meetings don't take place in that fancy room, uh, but in a back room. And I thought I'm sitting there and I thought, well, I won't speak today. I'll just wait to see if they like me um, and who is who. And then I looked at the sign that said the United States. And I thought, if I don't speak today, the voice of the United States will not be heard. So even me talking to myself after I told my class to interrupt, um, it's an act of will if you're the right. only one, you know, to, to speak up. So do you think that academic institutions promote or teach some of these skills or even foster them in students? Uh, and if not, how could they do a better job of it? Well, I think it depends. I think some do, some don't. You know, I think that um, what is interesting is having gone to a women's college where we had all the leadership roles, uh, it takes a while to get used to. Then in Columbia, by the way, one of the things that happened to me in college, I was in the middle of the alphabet because my name began, my last name began with a K. And all of a sudden I'm at Columbia and in a co-ed class and my name begins with an A. 
And so um, I was called on all the time. Uh, but I do think that, uh, I, th I think that there needs to be encouragement uh, because um, there have to be ways, for instance, that the professor encourages uh, women uh, and men to deal with each other. Um, and that it, it is something that needs to be taught. When I was hired at Georgetown, which had been a single sex school, it was in order to be a role model in many ways. And so I would meet with, the, I had co-ed classes, but I would meet with the young women to kind of talk about how, what to do in class, how to do things. I did a lot of role play and put women into roles that they normally didn't have. Uh, but I think it has to be something active and uh, mentoring and supporting. And, um, and, and you hate to tell people how to behave, but, but basically, how to operate in a setting that might not have been something that had happened to them before. When we met earlier, we were talking about some of the challenges of having to now teach remotely and teach online. Do you think that there are unique opportunities to do this or does it make it harder to actively promote some of these skills and to do some of the approaches you just mentioned? I'm so glad you actually asked this because I'm trying to figure out um, I, I always in the fall teach a graduate class and undergrads in the spring. So I've got graduate students now and it's kind of a half and half men and women class. And um, when I have taught in person in the past, it always takes a while for people to kind of uh, speak up in class. They're uh, both men and women. I mean, it's, uh, and so all of a sudden we're doing it virtually and there is more discussion early on than I've ever had before. And I'm trying to figure out hmm. whether in some ways um, there is less uh, kind of a sense of trying to prove yourself when you're sitting around a table really, or whether when you're in a little box on a screen, um, whether in fact it gives people more permission to speak out or uh, less feeling of being judged. Uh, so I, I don't know whether uh, that can be proven at any point, but I've definitely, uh, we've had three classes, and they all have had um, very much uh, a, a very active discussion by both men and women in the class. That might just be a tribute to your own teaching skills, because I know at Johns Hopkins we've had a number of conversations about how difficult it can be to inspire student engagement remotely. So that's, uh, that's we'll have to learn from you on that one. <laughs> So I'd like to talk a little bit about mentorship, which you brought up earlier. And in your interview with Trevor Noah, you explained how you decided on the title of your book, Hell and Other Destinations, referring to one of your most famous quotes. I know you hear this all the time. There's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And you explain that those other destinations can be achieved when women help each other. And as you said earlier, it helps when there's more than one woman in the room. How have you utilized mentorship in your career, either as the mentee or the mentor? Again, I think one of the things I have to refer to is I am older than everybody that's listening to this. Um, and my experiences really were very um, peculiar. And when that statement I made um, a very long time ago as a reflection of what was happening to me. Um, and we've already discussed, I had children and I was going to, to school. And what I found was that women that were very judgmental about each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and there would be women that would say to me, what do you mean? You're not home with your children or later you're not in the carpool line. Instead, you're sitting in the library. Um, or they would actually say things like my holiday sauce is better than yours or <laughs> whatever. And I, and I really found the that we are judgmental about each other. That's one thing. And the other thing that led to that statement, which by the way was so famous it ended up on a Starbucks cup, um, was that I was uh, doing my political life when Geraldine Ferraro was uh, the candidate for vice president in, in 1984. So, um, and we were somewhere on the road in the Middle West and this woman came up to me and said, how can she talk to a Russian? I can't talk to a Russian. Well, nobody was asking this woman to talk to a Russian. And, women also have the tendency to project our own sense of inadequacy on, onto other women. So uh, I do think that what I have found is that we need to be more supportive of each other and not so judgmental. 
and not so uh, and judgmental in terms of how each other behaves, but also projecting the sense of inadequacy. And that was where my statement came from. Um, it never referred to the fact that one should have to vote for every woman. Um, there's definitely women I disagree with and would never vote for. But I do think that it's something that is important in terms of mentoring and understanding. And, and I do think to go to back to something that we talked about earlier, the intergenerational aspect of this, I think is terrific. Um, and, and I do learn from younger women. I have three daughters, uh, all of whom uh, are, have very significant jobs, have children and are married. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to see um, how they have developed. And I keep asking them whether I was a terrible mother. So, um, but I do think that there are important aspects about intergenerational um, consulting and helping each other. So I appreciate that. I mean, what you, you've now given us many skills that women have, but I've also sort of talked more broadly about some of our, our weaknesses and how to address them. Did you have any female mentors? Because earlier you described the role of a, a male mentor or what some people might say a sponsor, right? Someone who really puts you up for positions. But did you have any opportunities to have female mentors in your career? Well, I did the, many of the professors at, at Wellesley, but um, in terms of the kinds of uh, jobs I had, no, frankly. Um, and, and I do think that um, the people that helped me the most were, I mean, Ed Muskie, despite his statement, and Brzezinski and Mondale and a variety of political figures. Um, you know, uh, uh, there were those who would say Eleanor Roosevelt, but I didn't know her. Um, but I, I, you know, really the professors that I had, those were my female mentors. Um, so, uh, but I think now there are women mentors. I think that, um, and who are, for the most part, are really eager to be helpful to, to younger women. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I do think that the mentor-mentee um, relationship is a very important one. I'd like to now move on to talk a bit about organizational culture. Um, you've once said we've since moved beyond the point when it might be said that so-and-so does something pretty well for a woman and that the era of condescension has passed. Um, but I, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about being in different types of organizations and environments, uh, maybe that haven't shifted as much. So what advice do you have for young women professionals working in hierarchical and gendered settings where age and sex affects how we're seen and respected? Well, um, I think that it's not easy because you first have to get a sense of what is going on. Um, but, and then I have something that I really do believe more and more that we women, whatever age, can't be angry all the time. Um, that it's important to kind of work the problem and try to figure out what it is uh, before you get mad. Um, but I do think that um, I know I found myself um, in many ways uh, condescended to, even though at a, I was Secretary of State, right. uh, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, just to tell you how this all happened, because I'd like to go back on, uh, you know, it didn't all happen automatically. What did happen, I was ambassador of the United Nations and it was very clear that the then Secretary of State Warren Christopher was not gonna stay for a second term. Um, and so uh, all of a sudden this period, which I call the period of great mentioning happened. And my name came up because I was a cabinet member and I was on TV fairly frequently. And then somebody said, well, a woman couldn't be Secretary of State because Arab leaders would not deal with a kind of woman. So the Arab ambassadors at the UN got together and said, we had no problem dealing with Ambassador Albright. We wouldn't have any problem dealing with Secretary Albright. And so somebody at the White House then said, uh, and I never want to know who, Madeline is on the list, but she's second tier. Mm. And so I never thought I'd become Secretary of State. So when I did, um, and Hillary was somebody that I had met uh, when she was head of the Children's Defense Fund, and she had gone to Wellesley, she's 10 years younger than I am, but we got to be friends, 
We went to the women's uh, conference in Beijing together, any number of different things. Anyway, I became secretary and we used to do this thing where she and President Clinton and I would sometimes travel together and we were in a foreign country and um, I introduced her, she introduced him and he actually said in front of everybody that during this period of great mentioning, Hillary would come to him and say, why wouldn't you name Madeline? Um, she is most in tune with your views and expresses them better than anybody else. And besides, it would make your mother happy. <laughs> anyway, so I get this job, uh, but it made a difference that I knew the president wanted me. But the things that actually happened hmm. were that um, he would have to say often in cabinet meetings, I want, because I'd start talking and he'd say, I want to hear from the Secretary of State. Um, and there were, and one of the things that really did happen to me was that um, I had no problems dealing with foreign leaders. I did arrive in a large plane that said United States of America, <laughs> on it, but I had more problem with the men in our own government. Hmm. And not because they were male chauvinist pigs, but because they had known me too long. Hmm. And so they knew when I made dinner at my house uh, or was the carpool mother. And they thought, how did she get to be Secretary of State when I should be Secretary of State? So there was a certain amount of condescension that went on around that. When I spoke about an issue um, that I was working on, like what was happening in the Balkans, literally, uh, some of them would say to me, don't be so emotional. Uh, you know, and so no, ma it's, no matter who you are, you still kind of get this kind of, it, maybe it's kind of endemic to people, men, but it, it does happen. And the question is how you deal with it. Um, and whether you um, awkwardly get mad or whatever, but I think mm -hmm. that that is something that everybody has to assess for themselves, but it does happen. Um, and I can tell a lot of stories about how it did actually. I want to circle back to this concept of balance that you talked about earlier. I mean, particularly as you were commuting, you had children, you were also pursuing your graduate degree what advice do you have for building a career in global health, considering all of the international travel like you were doing in your career and also balancing life with family? And I, I believe this is a question that's also come up in our, from our audience. So what advice do you have for maintaining or ob obtaining this balance? I think you have to try, but it is truly hard. Um, and, and not be too hard on yourself. I think that, which is why, uh, mm -hmm. I said before that I asked my children, who now are doing all these different things, whether I was a good mother. Um, and so I was very heartened to uh, hear them say that I was, but you never quite feel it. And I have to tell you on the life, I have the most incredible real life balance story. Um, and I was just talking about it because it's the 25th anniversary of the Women's Beijing Conference. So speaking of life balance, I had to leave my youngest daughter's wedding festivities in order to get on a plane to go meet Hillary to go to the Beijing Women's Conference. So talk about trying to, to balance two different <laughs> issues. And I think it's hard. I, I do think it's hard. And, and I think it helps if you have support on it uh, and if people understand. Um, and, and I think that um, the question that I, and I can't to this day really answer it is, whether um, it is better just to deal with the issue or complain. Um, hmm. I think mostly it's better just to deal with it as best you can. But if you um, say to people, I can't handle all this, then you undercut the fact that you as a woman, I believe are trying to prove you can do anything. Um, and um, it does take organization and there's some bad times. There's no question, but I think it's the hardest answer, the hardest question, frankly, to give a, an honest answer on. Well, and I, I think I appreciate you said that, that there were times where you didn't feel like you were, that you were doing a good job or doing the, the balance well. And I imagine that there are many people, regardless of if they have of children or not, who are still thinking about life and career who don't always feel that they're doing a good job. So, and, and I, I think balance can be a bit of a misnomer. You know, sometimes you do some things well and sometimes yeah. you do other things well. 
Okay, I so I want to move to my last question before we get to some questions from the audience. Uh, and again, this you've preempted all of my questions, Dr. Albright, of course. Um, but in a recent interview, again with Trevor Noah, you talked about leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic, and you mentioned this earlier as well. But through his inconsistent views and statements, President Trump has contributed to an already difficult situation by forming greater distrust in governments. But alternatively, we've seen We've seen contrasts in other countries led by women leaders. Lost you, yeah. Um, so we're increasingly seeing that science and evidence are dismissed and even undermined in the decision-making process at a national or international level. So what is your advice to young leaders on how to uphold science and ensure that decisions are made based on the best available evidence? Well, I think um, it is so troubling to see how science and facts are being dismissed uh, for political reasons. And so I think you've asked a, a key question in terms of how we deal with what is going on. And I do think that it requires um, a deliberate effort to keep pushing science in a different way. But I must say that it is not easy at the moment when there are so many contradictory statements coming out, some mm -hmm. by people that putatively have something to do with science or, you know, may have some political influence so that uh, being directed against them so they don't say it. And so there's a real question generally about science. I mean, the world isn't flat either, you know, and so I think that there needs to be a, uh, more of an organized way that the scientific community um, expresses itself um, to make clear that the only way that we're going to be saved um, is by respecting science uh, and that um, it is important for people to state their views and have the support of others in it. But um, I have been stunned, which is an understatement, frankly, in terms of the way that science has been dismissed. And so we can't operate ever, but certainly not in the 21st century without having a respect for science. Um, and therefore um, the scientists, both academic and practicing medical people and um, have to speak out. There's just no question. And I know it's difficult when you are being uh, put down by uh, the government itself. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, speaking of, it would make your mother happy. My mother was one of the first people to ask a question in today's session, so I feel I have to give her a voice, but it's also quite relevant to our conversations okay. about current events. So she asks what your thoughts are about the issues surrounding the appointment of a Supreme Court judge to replace the irreplaceable Judge Ginsburg. Well, I think there are so many issues that are going on around that and she is was irreplaceable i mean um a stunning woman in the things that she did for justice for women for all people um and i think the fact that it has become so politicized is um a tragedy in many different ways um it is an incredibly important appointment it is buried at the moment in politics um and and i think that there are unbelievably important issues for women that uh, are dealt with, not just the way she did, but basically in the court in terms of, uh, I do think that one of the things that she was able to do was to have respect for men and women. Um, and basically women need to have the right to decide what we do with our bodies. I mean, that's, that's, basic, you know, why can't we do what we want so that, and then all the issues that have to do with um, health programs and what really is a, a pre-existing condition and things that are, I think there are a level of things that are immediately essential uh, to be dealt with as we think about all this, uh, but it's buried in the campaign and in lies, frankly, um, and so I'm, I'm very worried about it, um, and uh, the timing is horrendous, um, and she was a remarkable woman that set a record that needs to be respected um, and honored, and we need to figure out how not to make a dreadful mistake. And, and this goes to something very basic, and um, 
I should have probably tagged this on to other questions, but, but basically younger women, I'm convinced of this, have to um, understand that things can be pushed back, um, that not everything is, everything is getting better all the time and that young women can stand on the shoulders of older women. Um, I'm very worried that um, many of the things that, that you and I and many others have gotten used to uh, can be pushed back. And that's what is so concerning about this. Um, and, and we have to be very, very vigilant about this. And I know that's something my mother would agree with and talk to me about when I was younger, that things can get pushed back, which mm -hmm. is why these, this is so important. Yeah. In looking at the current field of global health, global engagement, pivoting towards more local ownership and grassroots work, how do you think Americans and the United States play a role in the future of global health? How can we as foreigners support local organizations within countries to promote self-sufficiency? I think what is interesting, and this is something that I just generally always teach about, is the connection between domestic and foreign policy. You know, we all, um, doesn't matter what field we're in, but basically need to understand what the local and national situation is, whether it's political or medical or uh, academic or whatever. But the bottom line is in order to protect our own people and our responsibility, um, given what is going on and what the world is like today, you have to know what's going on in other countries. It can't just be me, me, me. Um, and disease more than anything knows no borders. Um, and we're seeing that. And, and, um, and therefore, um, if there are going to be, and there have to be some solutions to this crisis, they have to be handled internationally. And we need to understand mm -hmm. that what happens um, in uh, any country, uh, it affects what is happening to us at home. And so the ironic part is that clearly this virus came from China, a very large country. We are now uh, one, you know, depending upon the numbers of one of the, the most uh, uh, victimized by what has gone on, but we have, cre we have become uh, the perpetrators of our own victimization because we aren't understanding the relationship to other countries and how it works um, and whether you need to work through an international organization or whether it's local aspects, but it is essential to know that in order for the United States and our population to do well, no matter what the subject, uh, it has to, uh, viruses know no borders. Climate change knows no borders. Nuclear proliferation knows no borders. And so I think it's important to understand the international um, environment in which a lot of this has to be solved. Perhaps on a more uh, personal level, and this question comes from Carrie Geiger, she asks, how do you think American women working as managers in the global South can support the development and career progression of local women who they supervise? Well, um, let me just say, I think that there is a natural uh, sisterhood on this. And, and there's so many things, I'm involved in a number of different things. One is democracy work abroad and with the National Democratic Institute. And what we have been saying is that uh, we need to see the positive part of technology when women, for instance, don't have to walk tons of miles to pay their bills, they can do it with a mobile phone. And then the women uh, that have been freed up are able to um, either get an education or start a business or uh, run for office. And I think that the women that uh, work in these countries do in fact need to help mentor and promote women um, in other parts of the world. Um, and I think that it is an essential part of some of the things that need to happen. I have to do a call out to one of my daughters who works for a fund called the Global Partnership for Education in which they are working very hard now on the education of young women um, in a number of countries uh, where they are operating. Um, and so the combination of having outside help and inside desire to make a difference is a very important component of how we can operate in the world. 
All right, I'm going to take a moment for a, a more lighthearted question. Uh, you know you're famous for your pins and have articulated many times how strategic you've been while meeting with foreign leaders to wear pins most fitting for your audience. If you were to meet with President Trump, what pin would you sport and why? And this question comes from Madeline Howard. The truth is I would not meet with him, but I do have a Donald Duck pin. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, uh, so we have a question from Jarrett Fisher, who is a current student at SAIS. And they ask, it seems most of your academic career was in Eastern European studies. When serving as U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and then Secretary of State, how did you become an expert in all things foreign policy so quickly? And what were the most important managerial skills in those high-level roles? Well, um I, I had to learn, but let me just say what was interesting. I did start out um, basically a political science and uh, kind of all the normal diplomatic history and things, but I also uh, broadened my interest in terms of studying communism and the role of, um, I wrote my dissertation on the role of information in political change, and I kept kind of broadening what I was doing. The other part that when I had the jobs that I had, and this is an important aspect. I never did things by myself. I, I was always, mm -hmm. there were those helping me or I was helping them. And so when I was at the UN and we were dealing with different subjects every day, um, I had incredible people uh, from the State Department uh, that were really very supportive. And I think that it is essential for somebody um, as they go up the ladder uh, is to never forget people that have been, that you need to have to help you and respect their capabilities and knowledge. Um, I do love foreign policy. Um, I am um, the daughter of a diplomat uh, and um, all we ever, and then a professor, um, and all we ever did was talk about foreign policy. But I do, one of the things to this day, I keep learning. I really, I think that I'm curious and I never stop learning. And I do think that international relations are a growth industry. We have a, a question. I mean, you've talked a little bit about not stopping learning, uh, taking up different opportunities. And one attendee has described having to move from position to position because they're grant funded, right? So it's, it's a little bit take what, take what you can get and what's available. So it's been difficult for them to develop a, a career path. So how, what advice would you have for someone like that to either have a more permanent role or maybe craft a narrative of career out of these different types of opportunities? I would craft the narrative. I mean, that is one of the things, uh, my last book, you talked about hell and other destinations. Why did I write it? Basically uh, to prove that I was still around, uh, <laughs> that uh, the various, when I left office, and the thing that I've always tried to do is make whatever I'm doing next more interesting than what I've just done. Not easy if you've been Secretary of State. And so mm -hmm. there were a lot of ideas that came up about what I should do. Go back to teaching, start a business, be head of the National Democratic Institute, give speeches, write books. And I said, yes. So I did all of them. And uh, what I have done is basically rationalize that they go together. Uh, and that uh, whatever I do in one field informs what I'm doing in another. Um, and it has, I, I believe it, is that I think that one can do different things. I think it all depends on curiosity and the willingness to do it and the willingness to see that you can learn something from something totally different. Um, I mean, for instance, what I, I find more and more interesting kind of uh, public-private partnerships where the private sector um, can help in terms of solving public problems. And it's true, the, the medical community is a perfect example in terms of being the doctors that then can link up with um, some of the government programs in a foreign country. Um, and so uh, really trying to solve problems together. Mm -hmm. and so I do think that um, it takes a willingness to um, be curious um, and to take on different things and, and move around and see it as a, as a positive rather than a negative. 
I have a question from Prativa Baral. She's a doctoral student at the School of Public Health. She says, regarding what you said about how things can be pushed back, what do you suggest young women do in the current climate? How can we tangibly push against this pushback? How can we convince certain individuals in power that issues we are facing today are transnational? Well, I think uh, one of the hard parts at the moment, um, and I, I have my kind of to-do list, and this is difficult, is to talk to people with whom you disagree instead of just dismissing them um, and try to find out where they're coming from on mm -hmm. things and then put yourself into their shoes as we said earlier. Um, but I do think that um, one of the parts I know that uh, people make fun of is um, you know, that every man either has a wife or daughters or something, but it can't be just because of that. But I do think that people need to understand um, that society cannot exist if, in fact, there is not respect for women um, and operating in some way where we can see each other's uh, strengths. I think it's very hard at the moment. There's no question. I mean, given the power structure and the misogynist ideas that are going on um, is, is just quite stunning. Um, and I really thought that AOC's, script, you know, when she was insulted and the way Mm -hmm. she was able to talk about it in Congress is very important. I think, and, and what was interesting, and this goes back to something I said, that specifically in that interchange when they were on the House floor, she wasn't angry, you know, and I do- Not at all. That having a very uh, kind of calm approach uh, undermines those that um, are trying to undermine you. Um, and so it's a matter of trying, but it's not easy, you know, and there's certain times, and as I said, here I was, Secretary of State, and somebody was condescending to me and I'm trying to figure out how, to, how you deal with it. So, uh, but I think that there are ways to keep, and not alone, by the way. I really do think, to go back to what I said, women need to support each other. Um, you know, none of this Queen Bee business. You know, I think that it's very important. Roberto Santamaria is a doctoral student at the School of Public Health, and he asks, with the modern resurgence of strongman dictatorships across the world, what do you say to people entering the field, like international relations or health, when our reputation as a country is suffering? How do we rebuild those relationships on a personal level? Well, I have to say that um, I, even before I was here in my house, um, you know, uh, doing Zooming all the time. Um, I did travel a lot, and I even, as a Zoomer, I have been talking to a lot of my foreign friends, and I think it is going to take some rebuilding in terms of um, our reputation, and it's going to really be something where relationships with people that you knew before that are, uh, are going to be very important. I have to tell you, one of the things that I've done is I created a group of former foreign ministers um, and we worked together when we were in office and we worked together since. It's under the auspices of the Aspen Institute, it's called the Aspen Ministers Forum. That's its official name. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. Um, <laughs> and what we do is we talk and try to, um, I, I have to admit that it's going to take some humility on the part of the United States to kind of, um, restore our relationships and I think it best it can be done best um, with uh, people that you knew before and say we need help because the US doesn't want to run the world uh, and um, I was just uh, uh, hearing some of the parts of what Trump said virtually at the UN yesterday it's ridiculous um, and one of the things that I have said is women can't be victims but the United States can't always act like a victim. Um, you know, we are part of the system. Women are part of the system. We have to be able to be problem solvers with others. Um, but I do think it's going to take some very specific personal relationships to try to rebuild our relationships and then have a president who actually believes that the United States has to be partners with countries and not just say, us, 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 me, me, me. 
Luann Chichester asks, what advice would you give to Black women who deal with a double-edged sword of their gender as well as their race as they advance their career into positions of leadership, particularly in these times? Well, I think, you know, um, it's a hard question for a white woman to answer, but uh, one of the things that has happened is in the various organizations that I'm involved with, whether it's our business or National Democratic Institute or Aspen, there are genuine discussions and questions about how to have inclusivity, how to be respectful, how to understand the kinds of issues that black women deal with um, and to see what we can do to be supportive. Uh, but it has to be talked about. And I think the interesting part is that uh, people just assume something uh, which uh, turns out really wasn't true. I know one thing, for instance, um, as a mother um, and with daughters and now grandchildren, I worry all the time about something. And we were in a meeting when one of my black colleagues said, when she sends her children off to school, she's always worried and mm. she's always worried with her sons. And you kind of think, oh my God, you know. Um, and, and I do think that we are now, um, unearthing this systemic racism that is affecting everybody. But I do think that um, there needs to be a sisterhood uh, that crosses all lines. And what advice do you have for those men who can better support their female counterparts in this role, not as supervisors or mentors, but as colleagues? I think that um, this is something that is happening I think young men are a lot better about this than men my generation, um, and that there really has been a growing up in terms of partnership um, and uh, people, men putting themselves into the shoes of women in some form to understand what is going on. And, and there is more partnership. Um, I'm seeing it in terms of the various places that I am, um, but I think it needs to be um, really um, cherished and encouraged in a number of ways and recognizing that um, we do need a co-ed world in order uh, to have a world, but also uh, basically in terms of the partnerships that can develop. And I do think the younger men are better about doing this. And I do think, and this is not easy, is when somebody is being ridiculous and sexist of calling it out, um, I think it's very important, you know, yeah, absolutely. not being angry, but saying you've just crossed the line or I won't accept the way you put that. All right, I have one last question for you. Uh, since we have the opportunity to connect with you because of your relationship with SAIS, uh, we have a member of the external affairs team that's asking what your favorite uh, memory was at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, there's no way to describe it exactly. I have to say this. Uh, those of you that are at SICE now, you're in a nice building, maybe two across the street from each other. When I was there, we were in some brownstone um, up near the Hilton. And then in order to have our larger classes, had to walk down to Brookings in order to have them. Um, and so my really favorite memory um, had to do with when we were this course that we actually named Wide Wide World. Um, in terms of all the things that we learn from each other um, and, uh, and what it was like. What I found interesting is because I always was older than everybody, um, in terms of developing friendships with people that were normal graduate age uh, and I was older with children and kind of um, the, the relationships that we developed in terms of understanding who was doing what at what time and how to respect each other. Um, and, and many favorites. I mean, there were great professors there at the time. I was delighted to be there. Um, and I was, because I was always worried about my grades, um, very happy to know that I did very well at SICE. Well, thank you so much for answering that and all of my other questions today. Um, I. This was just a remarkable opportunity for all of us. So thank you again for joining us. 
Um, I'd like to, for anyone who's remained on the call, uh, we have a couple more uh, events coming up in November and December in this same series, so please join us. Somehow I've seen a remarkable number of you have joined us on our Slack channel, which is really designed to, to promote networks and advice and to have more conversations about all of the things we've heard today from Dr. Albright, so please join us there as well. And Dr. Albright, again, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. I had a wonderful time and thank you for asking me all those difficult questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>